this morning. We're going to look at a Christmas Day a message. Let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 2 at verse 1. And what I'm doing is I'm sharing with you some things basically that pertain obviously to the birth of Christ. So in verse 1, chapter 2, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You will find, and this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. When my children were very small, they're not small anymore, but when they were small, I wanted to emphasize with them what Christmas was all about from the very beginning. You know, and so what we did as a family from the time they were, uh, you know, just a few years old, the oldest would have been just a few years old. We did this for all of their life until they moved out of our house just last week. No, until, <laughs> until they moved out of our home. Uh, we, would in, we would have a, a Christmas Eve, and we would give to them a Christmas Eve uh, a present. Because we wanted to teach them that Christmas wasn't about them. It wasn't their birthday. It wasn't some special occasion for them to be receiving presents just because. But there were reasons for this. And so what we would do is we would have them all pick out one gift. And there were four of them. And we'd have them sit around us. And they would um, wait. And they would open their present. And they only opened the present one at a time. I didn't allow them just to open them up and dig through it and look at it. No, I, I wanted to teach them that there's a joy not only in receiving but also in giving. And that they ought to rejoice with others when they get something. And that's how I raised my children so that they, they would understand that at Christmas is a time where God gave to us and we should rejoice in the gift we've received and we ought to be able to rejoice in the gift that others receive too. And so we would do that. And you've got to imagine they were small and they're anxious and they're wanting to open up their present and all. But I wanted to teach them something about being moderate. I wanted to teach them about patience. I wanted to teach them what a real gift is all about. And that's how we did it with them all through their life until young adulthood. And um, what I would do is I would have them there seated. But before they were opening up their present, I would go through this particular passage every Christmas Eve. Every Christmas Eve, I read this passage to my children, and I shared with them about the gift that we received, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so that I'm kind of doing with you what I, what I would do with my own children. I'm giving you much more information, obviously, than I would give to them as, as children, though the information over time grew in, in terms of uh, the amount of information I give them. But this is basically what I would do as the father of a family, and I'm doing that now as, as a pastor over a church, the same kind of thing. We've been celebrating, as mentioned uh, a moment ago, together with our church family for 38 years. You know, And I'm so grateful, I really am, that you took the time to come and to join us today just to celebrate the reason for, for us even having a Christmas season. And so let me share with you now, as we look at this passage, let me give you a few things found here in Luke chapter 2. And we'll begin with the obvious. Very few scholars believe that Jesus was born in December. Uh, the date of the birth uh, was made to coincide with a festival that the, uh, that the Romans would celebrate, a festival called Saturnalia. 
And this particular pagan festival was a festival that celebrated the return of the sun after days of increasing darkness. And so people will say, well, why did you Christians adopt that date? Well, believers have always redeemed elements of the culture that we live in in order that we might utilize those elements to proclaim the Lord. We, we have redeemed all of the elements. We've redeemed art and, and music and clothing styles. We, we, we have redeemed movies and, and music, books. Even tattoos have been redeemed, you know, because there are guys that I know and even women who have tattoos that, uh, that they use to witness. We've redeemed the elements of the culture in order to present our faith in Christ. And, and so in this day, Christians regarded the sun's victory over darkness as a symbol, as a symbol of our own beliefs. You see, when you look in the Old Testament, in the last book of the Bible, Malachi, in the Old Testament, Malachi, it says in chapter 4, verse 2, For you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And so we use that, the Christians would use that, that scripture to present the sun, but the true sun, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N of righteousness. In Luke 1, 78, 79, well, that, that, those verses speak of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And so they used this, this particular festival as a symbol of our own faith. You see, in this symbol, it, rather in this festival, there were gifts that were given to the poor. And Christians recognized that Jesus was the greatest gift and that Jesus championed generosity. And so they would give gifts, but they would do it in the name of Christ. So for us as believers, I, I don't get in arguments with people about, well, when was Jesus born? Because there are people who come and knock on your door and want to fight with you about December 25th. Perhaps some of you had visitors who did that. They do it every year. They come and knock on your door and they want to argue with you about the paganism and this and that. I don't get into arguments and Christians don't get into arguments over that because for us the fact that Jesus was born has always been more important to us than the date of his birth. The fact that he was born. And so what we have here is the story of the birth of Christ. Now let me give you a little bit more information. Both Joseph and Mary were descendants of King David. And because of this, they, they made the journey to their tribal home in Judea because it had been ordered for them to go there to be registered. Bethlehem was about 70 miles away. It was a very difficult trip for Mary because Mary was about to give birth. And so as they arrived in Bethlehem, they discovered that there was no space left. With so many returning to register, everything was completely occupied. Friends and family members would have already made their uh, their homes available to their own friends and family and perhaps to strangers. So everything was taken up. It, the Bible tells us very, very uh, clearly that, according to verse 7, that there was no room for them in the inn. So the inn, when it speaks about there was no room for them in the inn, the inn in this case was an enclosure. It was an enclosure where, where travelers would drive their cattle for the night. The inn would have water supplied, but it had no host, it had no food, it, it had no ordinary comforts. So what, what Luke is pointing out here in chapter 2, verse 7, is there wasn't even room for Mary in a stable. So she gave birth outside of the stable in the cool of the evening. And so what we have here, even in the introduction, is a glimpse of the Savior of our world. He was born to poor parents in the most humble and humbling of all conditions. And we know that, Joseph, and we know that, Mary, were financially poor. How do we know that? Well, later on in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, Luke speaks of, of when Jesus was presented to the Lord, when he was dedicated. That was eight days after his birth, and that's when he received circumcision, and that's when he would be named. When you read your Bible, you'll discover in the Old Testament that a woman would be impure for 40 days after the birth of a son in order to remind Israel of the curse that had come upon the world through, through Eve. At the end of her impurity, there would be a sacrifice for her cleansing. And, and in, in Luke 2.24, it, it says a sacrifice was made of either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And, and that tells us that they were poor because in the Old Testament, the law spoke concerning the cleansing and offering and, uh, and uh, they were, if they were able, they were to offer um, a, a lamb 
of the first year as a burnt offering. But if they were poor, they would offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And so that tells us that Joseph was not a man of substance. He wasn't a, a, a wealthy man. It tells us that, that Joseph and Mary came from humble, um, you know, not impoverished, but humble circumstances. And what does that tell us? Well, it, it, it reveals to us that God's love and grace is revealed through Jesus taking upon himself human flesh and, and being willing to be humbled. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. That Jesus gave himself for us and that he came and took upon himself human flesh and, and dwelt amongst us in a way that uh, the most impoverished of his, of his community did. The Bible tells us here in verse 7 that she, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths. Mary did this without assistance. There's no mention of a midwife. There's no mention of another woman there who's giving aid to her. It simply says that she delivered her firstborn son. There's no details about that. One would wonder whether, whether Joseph, who was yet to have any intimacy with his, his, his betrothed wife, uh, whether he was there accompanying the birth of, of the Son of God. It doesn't say it simply says that it was there that she completed her days and it is there that she gave birth to the Savior. And this sacred moment was shared with, with her God and possibly with Joseph. And it says here she brought forth her firstborn. The firstborn speaks of a chronological order, but it also speaks of prominence and it speaks of importance. And so Jesus was born. There was no room for them in the inn. So as this is taking place, verse 8 they were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. As this is taking place, heaven responds. What you have here are shepherds. They were called ordinary temple shepherds. But they received what is called a heavenly birth announcement. And it's interesting to see that the first to hear of the birth of Jesus were shepherds. It's interesting when you make note of the fact that in the Old Testament, God refers to himself as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then you look into the New Testament and Jesus Christ refers to himself as the good shepherd. And so the Lord is represented in that way as a shepherd. And it's interesting that the God of the Bible, who refers to himself as the shepherd, the Messiah of, of our lives, Jesus, who is referred to as a good shepherd, it is interesting that he would first give an announcement to shepherds. These are temple shepherds. These were the shepherds who would watch over sheep that were to be offered as sacrifice. And when you think about it, God had made promises of a Messiah to Abraham, to David, and both of them were shepherds. And it's revealing that the completion of his promise was first revealed to shepherds. And these shepherds were caring for the sheep that would be offered as sacrifices in the temple. They would have most likely been aware that, that one day Messiah was going to come. And they knew that Messiah would come from Bethlehem. That was commonly believed at that time. When you read John 7, 42, uh, it reads, Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So there was common knowledge amongst the people that Messiah would come from this small town. And so this great hope that they had as, as shepherds, temple shepherds who, who cared for the sacrifices, this great hope of Messiah was coming true right before their eyes. It says in verse 9, an angel of the Lord. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Every once in a while, I, I would hear some pastor claim to have angelic visitations. I still remember one, one guy, he was on TV speaking about how... how uh, he, uh, he had an angel come and speak to him and all, and, and he did it in such a casual way. The Bible teaches him when an angel appears, you're not casual. 
You're not just kind of hanging around, hey, how you doing, Gabe? It's not that. That's not how it works. I mean, when you read the scripture, you see that there's a terror. There's a fear. There's something, there's something holy in front of me and that, that, that makes me realize my unworthiness. And that's what's taken place. There's a sudden appearance. The angel of the Lord is standing before them. The Shekinah of God, the glory of God, this cloud of brilliant light revealing God's presence to them. And he saw this glory. Their hearts trembled in fear. And the brightness of glory of the Lord produced great fear in their hearts. It only took a moment for them to realize, I am in the presence of holiness. Now, they knew of the miracles. They, they knew the scriptures. They knew of angelic visitations. They, they knew of the leaders of Israel, men like Abraham all the way to Malachi. But now an angel is standing before them. You can't imagine that. And they feared for their lives. There had been 400 years of silence since the closing of the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. But now, God began to work amongst men. And as he's there, verse 10, the angel says to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Notice his first words, the words of comfort. Don't be afraid. I'm not bringing judgment. I'm bringing joy. Your world lacks it. Your world has been under oppression for hundreds of years. And I'm bringing you good news. And this good news isn't just for you shepherds here in a field watching your flocks by night. This is good news for all people. Isaiah 52.10 says, The Lord has made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And he goes on to say in verse 11, there's born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ. The word Christ means the anointed, who is Christ the Lord. That fulfills a promise that was given through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 9 verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born, which speaks of the incarnation. God has taken upon himself human flesh. And unto us a son is given. The word given means provided or delivered. A son given is a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrificial death. Even in the prophecy of his birth, there was a hint of his yielding his life for us. And he says, there is born to you this day a Savior. The word Savior speaks of a deliverer. There has been born a Savior, one who will confront all the sin of the world, one who has been sent to rescue you. And again, that's why we Christians celebrate Christmas. That's why we Keep Jesus in the center of Christmas. We, we don't say happy holidays. We don't go holiday shopping. We don't give holiday presents. We don't buy holiday trees. We don't send out holiday cards. We keep Jesus Christ in the center because Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about a holiday. It's about Jesus Christ and Christmas. Christmas is identified with the birth of Jesus, who's our Savior. He's not just a little baby that was born that we celebrate and give gifts to one another. We need a Savior, and that's the center. That's the heart of the Christmas message. Much of the sorrows of our lives find their cause in our choices that have led to consequences. In many ways, we are simply reaping what we've been sowing through a lifetime. We need a Savior. As for the penalty of our sins, we need to remember that we are all guilty before God. We live in a time when sins are made excuse for, where we say it's the way I was raised, or it's, a, it's my culture, or it's my nation. But, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that we are guilty of sin individually and that there's a penalty. The Bible in Romans 3.23 says it like this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men to die once, but after this judgment. 
So the Bible teaches us that we were born in sin. We are sinners by nature, and there's a penalty for it. And there's, there's a day we stand before God to give an account of our lives. But the Bible also teaches that because of that, Jesus took our punishment upon himself. In 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but raised by the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we trust him as our Savior. We say we accept his death on the cross for us. We recognize it as sufficient payment for our sins. We cannot do anything that is sufficient to cleanse ourselves from our own sins. Our sins are that bad. It took God taking upon himself human flesh and dying on a cross for us that he might be our savior because only God could pay that penalty. So we accept that death. That's how we were saved. We recognize it as being payment. In 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And his payment is complete. We cannot add to what he has done. And he grants us forgiveness based on his grace, not on our best efforts. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so he's speaking concerning that. There is one who has been born, a Savior. He said, Don't be afraid. I bring you good tidings, great joy, which will be will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The word Christ means the anointed one. This name points out the Savior of the world in his prophetic, royal, and priestly office. Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil when installed into their offices, and as Messiah, he is the Lord. He is our master. He's the anointed one, and as his servants, it's our duty to serve him totally. We are children of God, but we are still his servants. Christmas isn't about us. It's not about the presents we may give or the presents that we receive. It's, it's about the birth of a Savior who is Jesus the Lord. He says in verse 12, this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. This will be the sign this is how you will know him amongst other children in that area. He will be wrapped in swaddling clothes. He'll be lying in a manger. Somebody said the shepherds would set aside every firstborn male lamb for the feast of the Passover. It was of great concern to the shepherds that these particular lambs remain without blemish in order to comply perfectly with God's instructions. One of the problems they faced was that it was common for newborn lambs to try to walk too soon before their legs were strong enough to fully support them. In those cases, the lamb would often inadvertently break one of their legs and therefore would no longer be without blemish. So it was common practice for the shepherds to wrap the baby lamb in swaddling cloths and place it in the manger until it was strong enough to go to its mother. And this practice ensured that the lambs remained without blemish. And so that's what they did. They wrapped Jesus, put him in this manger. And when this happens, verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. We like to sing Silent Night, but it wasn't. It was loud. They were, they were suddenly, this host was, 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 was proclaiming glory to God in the highest. And I, I notice with me how in verse 14 it says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Glory to God and then peace. Here in a moment of time, we receive understanding that should change our lives. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men occurs after God is given glory. There's no peace on earth except among those with whom God is well pleased. When you read your Bible, you see, you, you see it lived out in, in, our, in our culture. Men, women are in a state of hostility. They're in a warfare state with heaven and with each other. The Bible says that the carnal mind is at enmity against God. 
the word enmity speaks of hostility. The unspiritual person, the person who hasn't been born again, the one with no true relationship with God is hostile against God. And I, I find that interesting. I'll say this quickly. This isn't in my notes. Forgive me if it offends you, but hey, Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> but it's true. Um, I hear people who will be making proclamations about their religion and how devoted they are. And, and I hear it a lot, especially right around times like this where our, our nation is going through turmoil and so much. And then you hear, I'm praying for you, I pray for you every day, I love everybody. And, and, and that's, that's what the Bible is talking about, guys. I love everybody, I don't hate anybody except for unborn children. And I, I have a problem with that. I have a problem when someone tells me that, that they love the Lord, yet they are openly and blatantly living in sin. And then they try to lecture me about living for God when I see their lives don't reflect any scriptural evidence that they know Jesus. I have a real problem with that. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe it doesn't bother you at all. It bothers me. Because if you're going to proclaim that you know Christ and live according to his teachings, if you're going to say that Jesus is my Savior, then recognize yourself for in need of a Savior and recognize that you don't have the place to be lecturing anybody else because we're all moving in the direction of trying to be the best that we can. And if you're a religious person, well, that's, that's okay. I, I prefer religious people over non-religious people, but religion isn't what matters. What matters is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and that relationship transforms lives and makes you like Jesus. And so if you're going to tell me that you love, then, then love everybody. If you're going to tell me that, you're, that you want to lecture me about being a good person, then practice what you're preaching. But if you're not going to do that, then please don't pontificate to me because I don't want to hear it from you. I want to hear what Jesus Christ says. I want to know how to live for him. And I get that from Scripture. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're all sinners. We're all in need of salvation. We're all sin and fall short of glory, the glory of God. And God gives to the church gifts, and part of the gift is the pastor teacher. But the pastor teacher isn't the perfect person in the church. The pastor teacher points to the perfect person, which is Jesus Christ, and understands that he, that I, that we who are pastors are simply on the same road wanting to serve the same Savior because we have the same need, forgiveness and grace. And that's what it should be all about. So rather than preaching to other people a message I don't keep myself, I ought to see myself first and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and help me to present this to people so that they might see that I sincerely believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he really is working in my life. That's how it works. And we're living in a time when, when people don't seem to understand that. We are living in a time of constant hostility to the things of God. And those who deny it are not opening their eyes. It's absolutely true. It's been said, he who sins wars against his maker. And the Bible says it very clearly that I am in hostile opposition to God. I am at war with him. If he says it's white, I say it's black. If he says it's sweet, I say it's sour. If he says it's up, I say it's down. I am at war with my maker. I need a savior. I need a new life. I need to know Jesus. And what happens is when men are reconciled to God through the death of Christ, we can now be at peace we're at peace with God because the war is over. And we can be at peace with one another. We can have peace in our own consciences. And we can have peace with our neighbors. And goodwill will dwell amongst us. And goodwill will speak in us. And goodwill will work through us. And it is this peace that we go forth with and offer to the world. Peace with God through his son Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And peace comes through relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Peace comes when I lay down my arms and I unconditionally surrender 
and I say, God, I have sinned against you, and I ask for your forgiveness. Transform my life and give me a new, a new life. Lord, awaken in me a sense of purpose. Awaken in me an awareness of gratitude for all that you've been and all that you've done. And Lord, may I serve you with all of my heart, all of my days. And I was mentioning last night, and I'll close with this, that um, on Friday, this Friday, I, I have the, the joy, I have the joy of celebrating my, my Christian birthday, 49, 49 years of walking with Jesus Christ. And thank you for, thank you for appreciating that. It, it means much to me because I'll be honest with you, at the age of 20, you know, I was anything but what I am today. And no, I didn't outgrow my sin. You don't outgrow sin, you refine it. You know, you lie when you're a child and you get caught because you're not good at it. But if you practice, you can be pretty good when you're older. When you're young, maybe you stole something. You thought that something, does, you know, you deserve it. Why not take it? You know, I can remember my son David at the age of about three. I brought him home. Uh, we had gone to visit some friends, and he had been wearing his pajamas, and I brought him home, and I carried him to put him in bed, and when I was carrying him, I looked at his right leg, and his right leg was, was about four inches longer than his left leg. He was wearing his little pajama bottoms, and I said, what in the world is that? And so I put him in the bed, and I untook his pajamas, and I lift, and I, and there were these little match, match car those little matchbox cars, little, little ones, some of you remember those? There were two or three of them. He had stolen them from his friend Adam. I was, oh, I said, oh my God, I, I have a criminal that I'm raising. I was, I was so upset. I, he's a thief, he's a thief. He, he's like his mom. You know, I was concerned. I was concerned. So I called his mom. I called Debbie. Debbie, Debbie, I'm so sorry. Little David stole some of Adam's matchbox cars. And she laughs. She says, don't worry about it. Adam has several of his at my house. <laughs> so they've been stealing from one another. You know, and when I think of these things, I, I think of how when I was a young man and I, 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 was, I had a religiosity because I had been raised in uh, a religious environment and, and I had gone through religious training as a, a youth and all, but no relationship with God. Christmas to me, when it came, was, it was just an opportunity to drink. That's all it really was, an opportunity to, to see if I could find some, some pot to get high. That was what it was. It was just an opportunity to party. I think many of you know what I mean by that. That's what it was. It was just, you know, we'll have friends over, we'll get drunk a bit, you know, enjoy ourselves, see who we can sleep with. That was how it was when I was a kid. And at the age of 20, you know, I had, I, I, I had hit the bottom of, of my own life. And at the age of 20, I had hurt so many people. I had hurt my family so deeply. The way I was living and the things I was doing, I, I couldn't take it anymore. The last month before I came, came to know Christ, I... I stopped eating. I, I, I would eat a, very, a morsel a day, but I was, I was either drunk or high almost every day of the last month before I came to faith in Christ. And, and I, I lost from 175, I went to 145. In a month, I just lost 30 pounds. And I wasn't big at that time. So you can imagine how I had, I had scaled down to almost nothing. I was starving myself as I was smoking pot and drinking and partying. That's what I was doing. And I was going down. I was going down. And as I was going down, I realized I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to die. I had almost overdosed. I, had, I drank almost a half gallon of wine. I had dropped something like five reds, uh, second all, and I was being poisoned. I, my body was shutting down, and, and I knew that I wasn't going to make it. I knew that. And that's when I cried out. That's when I cried out. I needed a savior. I celebrated my Christmas, December 25th. 
And two days later, God gave me the greatest gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, December 27th. And my Christmases have never been the same since because I have the reason for the season dwelling in my heart because Jesus Christ <laughs> saved me. So Christmas to me, it's not the most important celebration, to be honest with you, because I, I'm one of those that Paul speaks about who says to every day, to some, every day is the same. That's how it is with me. I see Christmas as a daily thing, a daily awareness that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I don't celebrate Jesus' birth once a year, and, and I don't celebrate his resurrection once a year. I celebrate that every day, because every day I remember what I was, and every day I thank God that I'm not that anymore because of him. And that is Christmas to me. I celebrate it, not because of a present under a tree, but because of his presence in my life. Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior. And I rejoice, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Glory to God and the proclamation of the gospel brings peace to men. And so here we are to celebrate the birth of our Savior and I have to say it before I pray. I have to say it again. God is so good. God is so good. He is so good.